So what are we going to do today? We're going to talk about pants and how to hem pants. Um, I, it's hard to hem yourself, hem pants yourself. Uh, it usually helps to have a partner. So we're going to talk about what is a good hem and how to hem it. Um, what you need to hem pants, is of course, a pair of pants. And they don't have to be ones you've made. They can be ones that you, you've purchased um, online, either men. Or, and we're going to mostly talk about men, but the, uh, but the same principles apply, apply to women's slacks. So uh, let's, where do you, how do you hem? First of all, you can't hem by just getting a measurement. If you take your pants leg and you measure from your waist to the floor and you think, oh, that's it. Well, yeah, no, that's not it. Because you move in pants. Uh, how a pants leg breaks, and by break, I'll show you what that means. That's the space around your ankle. And you, if you have it too high, you look silly. Unless it's really skinny jeans and you've got really incredible socks that you're trying to show off. I don't like pants that are too short, although some people can get away with it. Tall, skinny people can get away with short pants. <laughs> Otherwise, they look silly. And it also depends on the style of pants. A pair of really tight jeans, they're going to look fine. Uh, they're going to look good uh, no matter what, um, no matter what they were when you're skinny and you're tall and you're, you know, and thin. But skinny leg pants, can handle being too high. Long bell bottoms, well, no. Those, those I've seen people dragging them things on the floor as they're walking and they look just so unkempt. Uh, pants that are too long, that are dragging them behind, number one, they're gonna wear on the bat bottoms. They're, that's gonna fray away very quickly. Um, and they're just gonna, you're just gonna look sloppy. You're gonna look like a hippie, which is okay if that's what you wanna look like, you know, and that's fine. Everybody's style is different. Then there's what they call the, your formal pants, dress slacks need to have some kind of a break. And we're gonna, I'm gonna show you a slide so in a minute where we talk about the different breaks and where are they, where they, they fall. You can't, you have to try on the pants. Uh, a lot of times my kids would just, get a bunch of pairs of pants and say, hem them all to my inseam of 36 inches or whatever. Well, depending on how tight, thin, the cut of the pants, they can, they are not all the same. The different fabrics, they drape differently, they hang differently. If they're cuffed, they hang one way. If they don't have a cuff, they hang another way. So bottom line, whether they're screaming and hollering, they're going to have to try the pants on so that I can get them properly measured. Uh, things you need to properly measure, you need some kind of chalk. I like the white chalk that goes away with heat. Uh, it helps to have pins, lots of pins. Uh, it even helps to have safety pins. And we'll talk about that in, in a little bit, why you would want to have safety pins. So, um, so what happens is it also helps to have something for them to stand on. If worse comes to worse, then go ahead and have them stand on the stairs. You also want them to wear the shoes that they're go predominantly going to wear with those pair of pants. Uh, a lot of times really formal pants and fancy things that you would wear that was at least women would wear with stiletto heels, real tall heels are going to be hemmed differently than if you're going to be wearing flats. So you, and, and if you wore those if, say if you hemmed them for high heels, super high heels, they're going to be too long if you put them on put flats. If you have, uh, you know, if you have, if you hem the pants using flats and you wear a stiletto heel, they're going to be too short and you're going to look kind of silly unless you're so, showing, off, showing off some really expensive, incredible shoes so that you want to see the ankle. And of course, you know, you can also hem pants mid mid calf. Those look really nice, especially when they're really thin. So uh, again, you want sometimes you want to have a ruler, uh, but it's usually not necessary. I sort of eyeball them uh, when I'm, you're doing pants, uh, and we'll talk about pinning them and whatnot. But where do you hem them? Oh, and if you're hemming, if you don't have the opportunity 
whatsoever of having anybody help you to, to mark the pants, your pants, so you can hem them. I would recommend where you want to start make it's like say you're make you want to make sure those pants are at least long enough to go from your waist to the floor on the side not on the inseam because depending on how tight the rise on the crotch goes depending on how also has an effect on how long those or short those pants are going to be so it's better to find out where your natural waist is where you're going to wear them and measure to the floor and that's a place to start and usually add about two, at least two inches to that measurement in order to hem if you have a raw edge. And now if they're already already hemmed, you're gonna you're usually gonna take that hem out before you even before you pin it. Okay, so um, if you're having to do it by yourself, what you do is you test that starting point. Say from waist to floor is 36 inches. That's a tall person. That's not me. <laughs> so you would start there. So you would take your pants leg. Get one here. Okay, you would take your pants leg, and usually, I I didn't cl uh, clip the threads, but I usually will surge the bottom. Where is this? I will surge the bottom of the pants for the most part, just to have an edge that doesn't fray a lot. And say I would mark, and usually I will mark it like say to. I didn't mark these. In fact, I just finished them about 20 minutes ago, so I haven't even tried them on yet. So let's just say right here, okay, is where that 36 inches is. Let me switch cameras. Okay, here's the pants. Okay, and this is where I have, I, I say as I determine that 36 inches. Then usually what I'll do is I'll just pin the whole thing in and I will, where the side seams are, where your side seams are, I would take another pin and these are dense knits and they don't like pins at all. Okay, right here. Invest in good pins, you'll be a lot happier. Okay, and say I, I've measured this and I think it's pretty straight, but I'm just guessing here. So on the side seams, I'm gonna put these pins this way. So here's my hem angle. Okay. So I have them going parallel. Okay. On where the front and the back go, where that, where the break would be. I'm going to put those pin, pins opposite. So perpendicular to the edge of the hem, just so you can get an idea of where they go. And you try them on. Then you say half an inch too high, half an inch too low, and come over here, readjust it, try them on. I, when I do this by myself, I have been known to have to try my pants on about 10 times <laughs> before it works. Okay, so you would try it on and do this over and over until you get it like you like it. And do both pants, not just one. Why? People are, you are not symmetrical. Sometimes one hips a little higher than the other. And while you, you know, if it's very evident, you can always put a long blouse on. But so yes, I was gonna say, yes, you're probably going to have to do this 20, 30 times, at least I usually do in order to get it right. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what, how pants should look and what a break actually is. So I'm going to share screen. Hopefully you can see this. And this is this area right in here is what I'm talking about as to what a pant break is. And that's essentially where the pants fold on itself or, or touching something else. So this is one where you don't have any break whatsoever. If you know you know you have a break, if you see a fold. See here's a here's see that fold in, in the leg. That means there's a break there. In other words, your fabric is folding. So when you have no break, like you have here, that mean those are usually on pants that are tighter in the leg. You know, they're they're straight up and down. They're, they're relatively small, and it allows your socks to be seen. And so these are good for jeans or for casual pants. 
or for rock stars, you know, they do that. <laughs> uh, but this, and, and it, so yes, that does, that, that's acceptable. It looks nice and neat, okay? Then you have what's called a quarter break. And what the quarter break means that in the front, the laces, the, the, the front of the pant, is, uh, as you can see on, I don't know if you can see my cursor, is just simply showing on right on top of where the shoelaces go. And the back of the, of the uh, pant goes to just the top of the shoe, okay? I don't see too many pants with quarter breaks. To me, quarter breaks look like they're just a little tad too short. Either going to do no break or you do something longer because then it looks, you know, like, yeah, they don't know what they're doing. Okay, now this is a half break. And this is what you see on most men's suits and on ladies' pants. And you'll see that this is coming down usually to about, so a lot of times it'll come to the middle of the heel which is where I like to put them. And, and we'll talk about, and, but yet that's not gonna work on a half break means these pants are going pretty much straight across, but they're coming a little bit lower on the front of the foot and a little bit lower on the back of the foot. And that's what most men's ready to wear is looking like. Then you have a full break. Now a full break comes theoretically to the middle of the heel. So if you're standing still, this is why the shoes are important. They'll come to the middle of the heel in the back. And in the front, they, can, they will come, they will, if you hold it out straight. Now this is gonna work better with wider leg pants because ideally that should come right to the center of the shoelaces, right to, to where the instep starts to curve down. That's where it normally goes. Now there is also, which I don't have a picture of, is what we call a slanted break. And a slanted break is what I've always been taught to use. And a slant break is gonna take it from the middle of the heel and the back of the pants leg when you stand still is going to be nice and straight. It'll be straight down, there won't be any break in it. And the front will, ha will, ha will not have a break if it is a wider pant and it will come down. But if if like, especially with women, this is not so much in men, but mostly with women when we're wearing heels. And these are usually, the this, this slanted break is usually for women who are wearing those pants with high heels. And high heels, the foot doesn't come out at so much of a 90 degree angle. The foot usually, because you got a high heel is angled more. So therefore, you can have that come down a lot lower in the front than it is in the back. You don't want it even because if you had that pant even and you're wearing high heels, if you step onto a curb, curb like from the street, what can happen is the heel is lowered and the end of those pants are gonna get caught in the stiletto heel. So for the back, when you're measuring them, the back should come no lower than the middle of the heel. I'm not talking about this bottom part of the heel. I'm talking about the leather on the shoe, you know, where the heel fits in, where the foot fits into the shoe. And then the front can angle down as long as when you are standing still, it does not have a break, it goes straight. And like I said, then it doesn't have to be, uh, doesn't have to be straight across, they can be angled. And so like I usually never wear flats. I always at least have a one, one inch heel. So I usually will slant break my pants. Now, when you're pinning these pants, okay? Say you're pinning them for someone else or for yourself. When you think you've got it right, there's some places that you need to make sure are right. You need to make sure both heels are hitting in the same spot. I have had like here, this one looks like this one's higher than that one, okay? So you're going to make sure, you're visually going to make sure this is going perpendicular to or parallel to the floor. You're also going to check this inseam at that point, And you're gonna make sure both of those inseams are touching each other when you stand and want, with your feet together, okay? Then you have them turn around on the front and you wanna make sure the rise is fall, the front rise is just at the same spot on both feet. Then you can also have them turn to the outside to check to make sure 
so you have a nice smooth line going from one place to the other. So you're going to always have at least four pins in every pant leg. Okay, now once that's done, you want to have that person or you walk around, sit down, look in the mirror, make sure everything looks right, because what looks good standing still may look horrible sitting down. That happens a lot, especially if the pant leg is tight. Pant leg is tight, you sit down and those pants go up about two or three inches. And they, yeah, that's so not gonna work well, <laughs> okay? So let's uh, stop sharing the screen. And any questions about that? So what that would look like, what that slant, that slanted break would look like on a pair of pants when you hem it, I'm not sure which one's the front, but it doesn't matter. Normally you go straight across like this, okay? What you would do is that you would take this front further out than the back. Okay, and you would adjust the side. So it looks like this. Okay, okay. Well, that looks good. So this is what the pant leg would look like. This would be the front or, or the back. Yeah, this would be like the, on a lady's pair. See, because when, when you're wearing the pant, the, this leg, this part's going way down, you know, so it can handle a break a little bit longer in the front or even a little bit longer in the back too for flat size tend to reverse it. Now problems that you have with a pant with hemming pants and we're not even at the machine yet. Okay, have you ever hemmed a pair of pants and they look puckered? You know, when it's all finished, it looks puckered here. And the reason that is happening, let me take this pin out, the reason this is happening here. All right. Yeah, I didn't press the pants. I just made them. <laughs> okay. It's like when you go to hem a pair of pants, the measurement between here, say I'm going to do two inches up. Okay. The bottom here is tapered. And what can happen there is that on a straight pair of pants, it's no problem. These are the same. Okay. But if this is a tapered pair of pants, just pin that in like it's tapered. It's really tapered, okay, a lot tapered there. Okay, so say it's this is it. Then you put it up and look at short. So therefore, when you hem it, it puckers right here. So you have a choice of a couple of things you can do. Don't try to hem it like that. You know, don't, whatever you do, don't, don't, force it don't try to ease it up it's never going to work so what <laughs> what you want to do is you want to either release the seams in other words unsew the seams from say if this is this is eight in, i'll just say eight inches 16 it says okay 16 16 and a half inches but down here say it's only seven and a half inches then you have to remove, you have to increase this seam by this, by that amount. So you just simply like say, here's, here's where my seam would go. It's like, say, right, there's where I want the bottom of my hem. I would, if it is between here and here, say this is eight and a half, I'm just going to say eight and a half in, or 16 inches. I know it's eight and a half, eight inches in half. You're going to take this seam out right here and you're going to expand between not see because you don't want to measure at the hem. You want to measure where you're going to sew the hem. So if you're going to put in say an inch and a half hem, okay, you have to say this is eight and a quarter inches. I'm going to have to expand release this between this point where that hem is going to fold and the end where the hem is going to sew, and you want to increase that. So you would take this seam out and make this part of the seam smaller so that this spreads out. Otherwise, you're gonna have a puckered icky mess. And my, my mother would not be happy. She used to make me do that. Now, on the other hand, when you had bell-bottom jeans, it was a lot easier because it's easier to take in. 
you would in, then do the opposite. You would, if this were sprawled out too much, you're going to take it in. Again, the distance between where the hem folds and where the hem sews. And if it's going to sew up here, this measurement must measure that measurement. Otherwise, that hem's never going to look right. On a skirt, it's a little different. You can take, or if you're doing this by hand, you can ease it in. But the problem with easing in on a hem is that when if you're easing in, you'll have little folds in the hem and not in the pants. Then when you go to press it, you're going to see those vertical lines where it's hard pressed. So that's not a good thing, okay? Now, when you're pressing hems, when you're pressing your hem, it's, I, it's not ideal to press from the right side because it makes a hard fold line. Granted, the first time you take it to the dry cleaners, it's gonna look like that anyway. That's what's what they do. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, what you wanna do is when you're pressing, you can put a card inside. Um, so when I'm pressing, let me, I'll turn the pant. Usually what I do is after I have, I have marked everything, you know, where I, I, pin, I have, wherever the fold is, and I'm just gonna do this like this. Okay, I usually will mark it with the chalk. And I'm just going to, I'm not caring where I mark it <laughs> because this is not gonna be a pant leg anyway, yet anyway. So I will take it, now I see my marks. I will take this to the outside and I will now start to press it. Usually I'll pin it and I like to use glass headed pins because they don't melt into the fabric. And I will put the pins, I make sure that I have everything nice and straight. And you'll see, I like to put my hem on the sides and on the inseam even. And you'll see if you've got any excess that you have to ease in. Okay. I usually will either serge the ends like I've done here, or I can take a hem tape or lace or ribbon, anything. There's hemming tape that you can also purchase too, which is like a twill tape that you can use on the hem. Or, or I, I prefer to simply do this because it doesn't show through on the front. Now, when you're doing the really fancy stuff, you're gonna wanna do these by hand. And I'm gonna show you how you stitch this by hand. Um, I don't do it very often. I will only do this for very, 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 very good expensive paints. We'll start over here on a seam. Mostly because I can give me, put in reinforcement stitches. You want your extra more stitch. Here, I'm just gonna, oh, this is like a nail. This is not really a needle. And I will do a knot and I'll do a lot close stitches because while I'm over here at the seam, I'm just sewing through the seam allowance and nothing's going through on the front. So some people you will see well, now when you're doing a hem, you're not going to sew a running stitch like this, or you're going this way, this way here. Oops. I'm working upside down. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> and like that. that, that's never gonna work. You wanna do what's called a herringbone stitch. You know, that's that's not a pretty stitch and it has no give. So if you did a did a one like this, I'm not going to do neat stitches because it's not going to stay. Okay, if you did a running stitch, even if it's a zigzag like that, it's going to pull out and it's going to break the hem. Okay, so you don't want that. So instead, what you do is what's called a herringbone stitch. It has some elasticity to it. This is the stitch we used to do before we had sergers, okay? Because now what you did is you went into your fabric here, okay? 
you went into the fabric towards where you finished and you're only gonna pick up a thread or two, okay? Okay, then you would come either on the top. I prefer to go under. I would turn it like this and pull this way and always stitch towards where you finish. Then come over here about every half an inch. And see, I'm literally picking up a single little stitch, hardly anything. Here, I can put this this way so I can see what I'm doing. Mm, here we go. Okay. And you're taking literally one thread and pulling it. And then you come under here. Again, you're putting that stitch towards where you came from, not where you're going. You can take a bigger stitch. That's about a quarter of an inch. And then you'll see it, it can show on there, but who cares as long as it doesn't show on this side. And then about a half an inch away, I will come over here and pick another few stitches and then another glob of stitches. And yeah, I don't have a thimble on. Okay, see this has got some give to it and it's not gonna pop and it doesn't show at all on the front because you're literally pulling those threads from the back of it, from the back of it and you're pulling maybe one or two little stitches and I'll do a couple more because what I've, I've done this and the only thing is, now if you're doing it for someone with stiletto heels, you probably wanna do these stitches about a quarter of an inch apart because you don't want those heels going through the hem. I've never had heels break out of a hem before. Not even out of, oh, well. I would do a lot neater than that. That's pretty terrible right there. That, that caught, I'll do one more correctly, okay? A single little, usually just, now these are a knit, so it's a yarn or two, just a couple yarns, and then come over here and then take a long, longer, about a quarter of an inch long stitch. And it cause, it builds in this loop, it'll build in this looping, so therefore it doesn't have, and Pant and heels won't go won't go through it, so that's not too bad. Okay. I don't do this very often. I will only do this on very expensive dress slacks. I will do it, however, on like my son's tuxedos because when his tuxedo pants, because see you see nothing there, and I'm using white thread. So I'm going to take my here's my needle, but needle this way you don't see anything absolutely nothing then you sew I will reinforce I'll do an extra little stitch at the front fold and the back fold and then when I come to this side I'm going to probably do a lot of heavy stitching right here and just do and and you don't have to do a herringbone here you're just going to do lots of little stitches so that will reinforce and it's going to be reinforced on either side of the leg so that's easy, okay? Any questions? Let me see if I have any questions. Let's see, let's see. Uh, what, what are the best pins to use for knits is what Jenny asks. Um, if you can find ballpoint pins, that's going to be your best bet. <laughs> There's these pins, they call them the magic pins and they, ha they don't have a ball at the end. Instead, they have a elongated thing and they're easy to grip those come in different lengths and they're very, very thin. My dressmaking pins, I don't nor I will never buy, I will never use these on, on anything I have to press because this is plastic and it's going to break. Um, I will use glass headed pins like this and glass headed pins are, are okay to use, but you have to be careful with some of the fabrics because some of the fabrics it's still gonna leave an imprint, especially if it's like a, a corduroy or, or a fabric that's some kind of nap in it, then what's happened is this is gonna flatten the, flatten the nap and everywhere you press it, you're gonna see a little imprint. So those are not. What I like is these. And these I've had for years and years. They're super thin and they're long. 
Okay, they bend very easily. I don't use them with embroidery and I don't use them with quilting because if I drop them, I can't see them. They do pick up with a magnet very nicely. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and they're expensive. I got, I think, I've had my, I've had these pins nearly 40 years. You want a good quality pin. Uh, these are hideous. Do not buy these. These will not go through anything. These are like nails. These are pretty, but they're like nails. This also like nails. Also, I keep pins way too long. If they're bent, you know, get rid of them. Really, they're not uh, that expensive. Although my glass headed pins, I will sometimes take it and reform it because A, you just can't find good glass headed pins and they're expensive. When I bought the, um, see, I guard these with my life. Nope, these. These are, and I just dumped them on the floor. Yay. Okay. So, anyway, these are IBC pins. The company name was IBC, and I got them in, it might have been G Street when it was really G Street downtown. Uh, but I got, I, I mean, I've had these for 40 years, and, I, I, and they were expensive. If I remember, tw I think the last, no, I take that back. The last time I bought these pins was in a shop in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and they had IBC pins, and I got really excited, and this must have been about eight, ten years ago when I bought this box of pins, and they were $21. I about had a stroke, but you know what? They've lasted me a lifetime. They have stayed sharp. Uh, you can get those pin cushions with the, um, with the emery paper in there and they say it sharpens it it doesn't it doesn't it might take a burr or two off but you know uh if, how you can make your pins last forever is a get the thinnest pins like i said not for quilting quilting i'm going to usually go with uh, flower head pins or uh, the ones that are but i like the thinner the better okay because they just go through fabric a lot easier um like I said, these were expensive and I do guard these with my life. I use them. Also, I don't like to use them in quilting because they, like I've got a whole, then my other box of IBC pins now is laying all over the floor. And I'm gonna have, but I have, dealing with pins, you need a wand. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Here we go, We've got lots of them here. <laughs> and I gotta put them back in the box. I'll just leave that there till later, <laughs> okay. Okay, so now we're gonna go to the sewing machine. We're gonna talk about doing line hem stitching on a sewing machine. Um, that's how I do most of my hemming, period. I rarely do by hand. If it's a pair of jeans, I may just top stitch them. Um, a lot of times now, oh, here's one tip. If you're hemming for kids, and the problem with kids is they have a propensity for growing. So if you're going to do a temporary hem, because this kid's going to grow, always make the pants legs really long. So what you do at first is you really put them in. Okay, oh, let me do right side out. Or right side in. Okay, say this is a kid's, so you put it in however long it's got to be, and a lot of times you end up with a lot of this going on. <laughs> so that's what you do is you make a fake, you make a, um, there's a couple things you can do. You can make a cuff, okay? I've got this hem here, so this would be where my hem's going to go. I'll grab a pin or two, okay? And you would. This is what I usually do is I would fold this inside. Okay, I will mark, this is where I want the hem to be at the end. So I come to here and go halfway or however, leave quite a bit, at least four inches. Okay, and then you fold it. You can fold it and hem it like this. 
So you would just double, double cuff it from the inside like that. Okay, so I'm gonna fold it in half and then fold it in half again and I'll put it into the middle. Then this is where I would be stitching. I would, okay. Cuffs are easy to do because they're really not that hard. You would just, you could do um, the blind hem or whatever you want. Goodness, this is really dense knit. That's what I get for buying bargain stuff. <laughs> okay, get another pin. See, I'm using the IBCs and these are really, this is an obnoxious knit. Okay, then you're going to fold this up like this. Okay, give a good press. Okay, this is what it looks like without the cuff. And then you just simply fold it up. Like it's already, it's already sewn in here. And on this side, you simply tack it. Doesn't need much. Here you're going to tack it at this, you're going to tack it in four places. Actually, you only, I only really need to tack it in two, which is where those seams are. See the side seam and the inseam is the only place you need to tack them because you've sewn it at the bottom. And I'm not doing this neatly. Sewn it at the bottom. And I would take a few stitches, sort of fold this open, and I would just hand tack this a little bit here and on this side. And then on the where the fold is, I simply take a little on this stitch and simply take one little tack place in one place, one area. Don't go this way, go in one place, one little knot to hold that. So you'll and you do that on both the front and the back, back where the uh where the fold goes or where the pressing seam, pressing line goes. And that way you've got a pair of pants for a little while, okay? And it doesn't make hard, uh, a lot of times if you stitch it down too much, and this, I, when it's for kids, I usually will do it by hand for the simple reason I don't want those stitches to remain showing for long. Because the problem with when you do it by machine, it puts a fold and it can make holes in the fabrics. And therefore, when you let them out, it really looks like it. So this, I don't care. You know, I mean, you, if you're doing it by hand, you're going to have it neater. And that way those pants will look nice. And then when it's time to uh, kid brew, you simply take out those stitches. And you know what? You've got like two, you, whatever, can, I usually wait until they're like high waters. <laughs> I don't wanna keep doing this. And then now you've got that hem that you sewed here. So now you're on to the next hem. Okay, so it was originally here. Okay, you've got it down and there, this can press out. Since you haven't done a hard stitching line on it, you're not breaking the threads and it's going to look, not gonna look like it was ever hemmed high. Then when they grow again, you got more to take out. You know, you just, it's a little thick. Uh, cuff pants are actually very nice because cuff pants actually hang better than pants that are not cuffed because there's more weight down there. Now, if you've got a pair of pants that's really super lightweight and they're constantly riding up and every time you sit down and then you stand up, they're stuck on your legs, you know, like, oh, especially tight pants. Okay, you could put weights in there. People have been known to put a few weights, uh, like a, just a uh, a washer or whatever inside the seams and that will hold them down that'll make them that'll go back down and so like I said here I've got this hem and then I could then I got another hem I mean I think it was originally up here and you're not destroying the fabric so like I said if they are tight and you're ending up having to mess with the uh the side seams to make them lay correctly well, for one thing with cuffs, it doesn't matter because it's always gonna fold in there anyway. And so, yeah, I don't even bother taking side seams in to make these, these measurements the same. Okay, let's go to the sewing machine. Let's talk about the blind hem. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix right here. I'm going to do my sewing. It helps to have a flat bed on your machine. 
This does help. And then I'm going to pick now if what's the baby loss to the brothers? So you want to pick your a blind hem. And a blind what a blind hem does is it'll stitch three stitches and then take a needle. Okay, here's one of them. If you're not sure, most of these machines have a sewing have an advisor in here. So I want to do a sewing guide. And I want to do a blind hem. Down here. And it'll tell you that stitch number 201 and 202 are blind hems. They are for use. One is for stretch and one is for the other for woven or other fabric. Now I have done most everything with this blind hem. With practice, it'll be so good that you will not see the stitching on the front whatsoever. And I've done it on pageant gowns, I've done it on wedding gowns and ballroom dresses, and no one has. You know, the best thing for knits is a, is the uh, cover stitch. Although I don't like them for pants legs, unless they're you know uh, sweatpants or something like that. I don't like to do a cover stitch on the bottom of, of pants. <laughs> I like them for blouses and stuff. So I guess that's about all I have today. If, oh, one question, one thing I want to tell you is the story. Well, I have one from me and one from Judy, and you don't have to sit and listen to it if you don't want to. Uh, but, well, I used to be a costume designer and I had my own shop and whatnot at one time. And my husband um, asked me to have him some pants from him. And he said, and, and I was always so busy, I never got around to it. And then finally one day he had enough, he went to a tailor. Uh, or we went to buy pants and he tells everybody that he had to wait seven years for a pair of pants to be him. How awful that was because here his wife was a professional and she would not hem his, my pants. And even now to this day, 40, we've been married 48 years. And I'd say this happened maybe 40 years ago that every time he goes to buy clothes, the entire store has to hear how He's got to have the tailor do it because he's not going to let his wife touch his pants because she's a professional and it took her seven years to pair to him pants. I went. Now, Judy, you know, Judy Bruning, who owns owns the shops, um, she has a story that when she became a singer dealer, that's when she started, that she bought this machine. I think it was the XL 6000. She loved that machine. But her husband asked her to hem pants and she looked at him and said, Oh, you can't hem pants with the, with this machine. It's an embroidery machine. You can't hem pants. He went, okay. So we went and had them done, right? Well, a few years ago, or a few years later, she had a neighbor who had, I guess it was a wedding or some big fancy thing they were going to. And just before the event, the hem came out of her dress. So she ran over to Judy in panic and said, please, can you help me get this done? And so she went upstairs and she hemmed. She was on the machine hemming pants. And then she said she felt this dread come over her. And in the doorway was her husband standing there going, mm, can't hem pants with that machine, huh? Busted. <laughs> so, so yeah, so we've all, these, these machines are for our fun, not for them. <laughs> so with that, I will leave you. And you guys have a wonderful weekend. I will see you next week. It's published in the newsletter what we're supposed to cover. And I hope to God I will be better at this, this computer stuff. And uh, I will if you would rather join me on Zoom next week, let me know and I'll send you an invitation to, to the uh, meeting. So that's about all I have for you. You guys have a great weekend. And I had fun sewing with you guys. Bye.